Okay, so uh, let's move to item two, uh, the innovative roadway and crossing design discussion. Um, Josh, how are we doing? Is Jim uh, part of that? Good, I'm going to ask Jim to come back. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was getting away, but I don't think your flight leaves until 10.30. I mean, so. <laughs> um, I, then we'll be done by 9.15, because sure. you can ride back, so we'll be there. Um, I think you all remember from our, um, those of you who have been able to review the phase one, uh, you'll recall that uh, Jim had made some se several specific suggestions about innovative roadway designs um, that they have seen and that they, they brought forward in that first phase, such as separating of uh, pedestrian and turning movements so that you don't have them happening at the same time, such as innovative treatments like um, flashing um, uh, pedestrian crosswalks illuminated from below, uh, talking buses uh, so we've seen in Cleveland, uh, experimentation with things like uh, buses that will actually alert caution, buses turning as it's making that movement. Uh, and then I think one of the fourth areas was something like a pedestrian scramble or the notion that perhaps you fully stop traffic in all areas and allow pedestrian movement exclusively through the entire area. Uh, I think those were by no means an exclusive list of suggestions, and I, I think that uh, one of the comments was that this, there's not a lot of data that necessarily exists to verify that these uh, are necessarily best practices. However, um, early data would show that they perhaps may bear some fruit, and all of these things that, we've, that I've just mentioned, are, n none of them are things that TriMet could do alone. Uh, and, uh, this might be a good opportunity with uh, Jim here as well. Certainly, I think uh, Rob Birchfield from the city is going to have a lot of input on, uh, you know, whether they've done these things or whether he's seen them. And uh, this might be a good opportunity to discuss some of those things specifically and also find out if there are other things to look at, are there opportunities to pilot, um, that sort of thing. So maybe that's my intro. Tom, I'll turn it back to you. So, let me start Tony with you. Uh, how much work has UPS done on the... Uh, the elimination of left-hand turns and how's it worked and what are some of the issues you've faced and surmounted? Well, the, the, the biggest issue, and you see it coming downtown here, is everybody wanting to turn left while everybody's crossing the street. So the, the most extreme concern are pedestrians, people, uh, and not always following the, the lights and that type of thing. So it's not a matter of... Um, hoping that the lights protect you, I guess I'll say. So it's a matter, it's truly really a matter of driver uh, skill, behavior, and visibility uh, versus, versus traffic lights. Uh, but the left-hand turn um, is, is easily done if there's good communication. And we, we talked about that during the job hazard analysis conversation a little bit, uh, that people have to see you, and whether it's a, a bus that talks or whether it's a driver using his horn, there has to be eye contact. And it's really as simple as that. If you don't have that eye contact, then there's risk. And in training at UPS, uh, how do you get operators, your, your operators, to focus on that? To fully <coughs> understand it? Well, it's, it's a good question. You talked about value here. Um, during the initial training and recurrent training, annual certifications of our of the drivers, every driver goes through an annual recertification regardless. Um, space and visibility is one thing that we can all benefit from, but is taught in terms of defensive driving. And, and basically, each driver is trained defensively to recognize the hazards before they happen. And that could, an example of that may be an individual on the sidewalk as they approach a corner, as a driver approaches a corner, and they are not paying attention to you, they're, they're distracted in some way. They have to be trained at that point to see that hazard before they get there. And that's really as simple, and, and, and it's crux, the crux of the training, is identifying that hazard before you get there. If you don't, then you're really rolling the dice. Because if you're really up to that pedestrian, and what they're going to do, are they going to step off the curb? Uh, are they going to bathe the traffic light? So really the training is... Is, is all space and invisibility. And can I go a step further with that? Sure. Um, it's not only eye contact, it's a, it's a non-verbal or verbal communication.
communication with those eyes. Somebody has to have the right of way. So you have to understand, based on you, everybody, if I see you and you see me, we still have to communicate who's going to do what first. And so there, it goes a little step beyond just mere eye contact. There has to be a understanding, a, a nodding of the head or, or, a, or a gesture of some sort saying that I am going to do this first. And so how that communication manifests, manifests itself is it's extremely important in that safety case. Uh, I'd be very interested in talking more about left-hand turns. There are a couple things that should be on the table, including removing left-hand turns from routes. There's probably no, I mean, there are reasons, but you know, there's a lot of reasons why you don't want vehicles turning left in general um, from a gas usage perspective, too. Um, uh, putting on the table uh, leading pedestrian indicators and what that would look like and, and, and what kind of standards uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation has in terms of LPIs and when, when those will be used. Um, and also make sure that we, when we talk about things like this, that there are people that can't see, so there's no way to have visual indicators if you're uh, visually impaired. And so what are some of the features that we can have in terms of other cues, whether it's a talking bus or, or other crossing signals to allow for the, that indication? And if I could make a suggestion yeah. also, um, eradication of left turns is a reaction. Okay. Eradication of a, left, of a left turn should be based on a hazard analysis, on a left turn by left turn basis. Not every left turn is a bad turn. A left turn is a bad turn if an operator is not vigilant, if space is not cleared, if eye contact is not provided. All the pavement-based LEDs and advanced warning indication systems will do you no good if an operator is not following a rule and procedure, if a pedestrian is not doing something that a pedestrian is supposed to do, because it is a synergy. When the left turn issue, and I spent a lot of time with UPS corporate folks on left turn issues, the whole left turn eradication issue started on a gas consumption basis. Right turns keep our vehicles moving. We don't burn as much fuel sitting in intersections. There's a net safety benefit from it that was fruit, not necessarily initially identified. The right turn issue became a fuel savings issue that also then became a, a net safety issue. However, transit agencies that did left turn eradications, Boise, um, Cincinnati, saw a two-fold increase in right turn collisions because they didn't solve the problem and the problem is operational it's not engineering okay. engineering is a tool operations in this particular case is the success or the failure of, of wherever you're going to go with left or right turns it's just another piece in the puzzle the hazard analysis the training of the operator the vigilance of the pedestrian all of those have to come together for a successful program. What about the severity of those right turns or collisions versus the left turn collisions? Um, as severe or more severe than we experienced here a couple of months ago. We, we had a, just the other day, we had a fatality of a mother with a six-month-old baby. Right turn collision. And this is an agency that has done yeoman's work in relationship to talking bus, left turn, right turn, talking enunciators, LED pavement, advanced training, but a, an operator that loses vigilance and loses situational awareness. All the engineering controls in the world are just warning devices that still require vigilance in operators and vigilance in pedestrians. In this particular case, the mother walked out against the light into the bus and nothing was going to change that based on the engineering controls that were in place, short of a pedestrian gate. So I, I implore you that the decisions that you make, make them analytically. Make them with applied science of, of hazard analysis. Take the safety data acquisition Mr. Birchville was asking about to determine what are our most hazardous routes with left turns, and then evaluate them for the purposes of whether we still want to continue those left turns or can we recut that route for a right turn only. 
but that won't solve all the problems. It still requires going back to the training department and continuing to re-emphasize right turn hazards, in, in, implement a recertification program for your bus operators to get them back to your qualified trainers and let those trainers continue to spend time with those folks. I think you make a very valid point and it, uh, without simplifying it, it really comes down to the quality of the hazard analysis and a hazard misanalyze will lead you off uh, to something that's not only not productive, could be very counterproductive. Um, speaking of um, right and left turns, um, one thing I noticed was that mid-block crossings you identified as kind of a last resort um, for a treatment, um, and that's, it's, it's obviously a crossing that doesn't have a right or a left turn issue with it, so I'm just wondering what, um, uh, what the reasoning behind that was. Well, the, the reasoning actually came from analytical data that we had done similar tasks at other, other transit agencies, and statistically we found that mid-block has the highest incident rates associated with it. It's most difficult for bus operators, seasoned bus operators to adequately negotiate. It's, it's fraught with hazards from the pedestrian perspective in relationship to trying to, to catch that bus at mid-block. It gives me so many options that are unsafe. Um, so we harvested data from seven properties that were, um, by the way, Smith System properties, which is the same defensive driving system that was applied here, that um, in trying to compare that, that synergy between the agencies and, and came up with the analysis that, you know, the, the mid-block was just the lowest ebb of, of, of um, a well-thought-out, well-placed, you know, stop. Um, and then that was supported by the incident data that, that defended it. And then the next step was to analyze the incident data once those mid-block stops were removed, whether we were still having high incident rates at that particular lo or that particular route at the new location. And we found that the incident rates dropped dramatically, which is that safety data acquisition that, that Mr. Birchfield was asking about. So by having that data, at least lets us say the actions that we took appear to be working because analytically it's supported by lower incident data. Uh, did those data um, separate uh, marked versus like marked with rapid flash beacons? No ma'am. No, um, again, because of the, the we, we strictly looked at the block location and not all of the amenities supporting that because they were so divergent from property to property. There was no baseline to be able to do that. 